song you may recognize uh, called Santeria, which you may not have realized was actually a reference to the topic that we're going to discuss today, which is syncretic religion in Latin America. Syncretic religion, religion being a mix of religion. So we're going to talk today for about a half an hour about the way in which religion was really mixed in Latin America. That is to say, Catholicism, as it was practiced in Europe, and indigenous religions. So when we think about the word syncretic and syncretism, we're talking about mixing. And as you guys know, anytime humans come in contact with each other, there is a very uh, strong likelihood for mixing. And in the case of the conquest of Latin America by the Europeans, there was a tremendous amount of mixing that took place. So, um, so, um, we have to remind ourselves that we're talking about the 1500s, right? The, the New World was discovered in 1492, but the conquest took decades. It wasn't until 1519 that a guy you may have heard of named Hernán Cortés uh, led the, uh, the, the move towards uh, conquering all of, of uh, Mexico, most famously a group of, uh, of a Mexican people you may have heard of called the Aztecs, or as they call themselves, the Mexica, or Mexica, which is where the word Mexico comes from. So we're mostly going to focus on Mexico, but this syncretic religious conversation could be uh, had about Cuba, could be had about Central America. In each place, there was a combination of local indigenous beliefs and uh, the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Santeria was most famous in Cuba, just again as a reference to our song to kick things off, I have a couple pictures of folks in traditional Santeria dresses, right? Again, mixing Catholicism, as you can see here, with uh, something uh, foreign or, or, or more traditional. In the case of Santeria, it also has major African influences in Cuba, but, but as I said, we're mostly going to focus on Mexico and on the influence of the beliefs of the Aztec people, the Mexica, and the beliefs of uh, the, the Catholics. So as you guys hopefully know, right, the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, today it's known as Mexico City, right here in the center of Mexico, and their empire extended throughout what is today central Mexico. Now we have to remember that again, the conquest of Mexico happens in the 1500s. And hopefully you guys know that there's been a very significant event in Europe starting in 1517. I don't want to scare you guys, but I'm going to show you a scary picture right now. Oh my god, extremely scary. Right? Extremely scary for Catholics. Right? This is of course Martin Luther, who was extremely frightening for Catholics. And the thing we have to remember is that this conquest right, of the New World was predicated on the European conflict, European competition between Catholics and Protestants, right? So we all know, hopefully, that the Spanish were devoutly Catholic. They rejected Lutheranism, and thus they really hoped to spread Catholicism in the New World. So one of the very important things for us to recognize when we consider these religions coming together is the motivation of the Europeans. The Europeans were profoundly motivated because they were competing within themselves the Catholics and the Protestants, right? So here we have the, the motivation for the Catholics to go out and convert each and every indigenous person that they encountered to their beliefs. Now you also may have heard of this guy, right? St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of one of the primary missionary orders. He was the founder of the Jesuits, but that was only one of a couple of orders. We have the Jesuits, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, these are three of the most famous uh, proselytizing uh, missionary orders. These guys came to the New World with a very specific goal of acquiring converts to the Catholic Church. Right? So that's the motivation that we have to, have to remember as we consider these clash of cultures or this coming together of cultures. Now, as you guys also hopefully know, the Aztecs, Right, had a pantheon of gods of their own, right? a tremendous system. They were very much polytheistic. Here's uh, two of my favorite uh, Aztec deities. On the right, we have Huichli Pochli, and on the left, we have Quetzalcoatl. 
Right? And uh, these two guys are two of many, many deities. Huitzilopochtli was particularly famous um, in no small part because he was the god of the sun, and it was for he that the, uh, the Aztecs engaged in one of their most famous rituals, uh, that of human sacrifice. So you can see, again, these are uh, Aztec drawings um, as this individual is uh, giving up his life's blood for the sun, right? an essential part of the Aztec tradition. But this is not a lecture about Aztec deities. Well, it sort of is, because the argument that I want to make to you guys is that this lady is, in many ways, an Aztec deity. Right? Perhaps the most famous of uh, uh, symbols for all of the Mexican people. Right, is the Virgin of Guadalupe. Right? And, and Mexican people sometimes um, are referred to as mestizo people, meaning a mix of races. Right? There, there are many, 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 that in fact, the vast majority of people from Mexico can claim both European and indigenous roots. And what I want to suggest to you guys today is that this most famous symbol of Mexico also claims European and indigenous roots and is therefore a spectacular example of what happens when two cultures come together. Right? That, that as much as the Europeans sought to conquer the Aztecs and erase what they considered to be their demonic belief system and replace it with Catholicism, ultimately the Catholics failed because they did not replace the Aztec belief system with Catholicism. Rather, a mix resulted that had both Aztec and Catholic roots, and thus we could call a syncretic religion. So what I want to suggest to you guys is that um, in, in both Santeria in Cuba, but also in a couple of examples I'll show you in Mexico, we see a religion that is not truly Catholic, but rather retains aspects of its indigenous roots. So hopefully you guys know a little something about the Virgin of Guadalupe. I mean, this, she really is uh, the, the, the national symbol of Mexico. And, and the Virgin of Guadalupe is uh, the mother of the Mexican people. Right? And if you, know, if you go to the mission or really spend any time in Mexico at all, the Virgin of Guadalupe is absolutely ubiquitous, right? unavoidable. Here she is in a mural. Here she is in a candle. Uh, here she is decorating some kind of grain silo or something like this, I'm not sure. Here she is on uh, cute uh, 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 dinnerware. Here she is on boots. Here she is in a little uh, uh, sort of modern style mural showing Mexican-American pride. Here she is on somebody's arm. Here she is on a cute bag. Uh, you get the idea. Right? The version of Guadalupe is an essential part of Mexican culture. And again, she shows that even though the Spanish sought to erase Aztec culture, Aztec culture lives on. And, and, and in telling you guys the story of the root of the Virgin of Guadalupe, I, I hope to make that clear to you. Right? So you may recall that the Aztecs were defeated in 1521. The conquest started in 1519 and it concluded in the summer of 1521. And as you may know, very violently. Right, the Aztecs were, were, were really uh, a ground into the ground. Tenochtitlan was destroyed um, and replaced ultimately by Mexico City. But very shortly thereafter, the first wave of Franciscans arrived. Remember Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, these guys have a very specific goal, and that is to spread Catholic doctrine, to win the competition with the Protestants, and save all of these Aztec people from what was certainly, uh, according to those Catholics, uh, a, a certain uh, afterlife in hell. So these missionaries arrived in Mexico with a very specific goal, but they encountered a people with a very highly developed belief system. So as the Catholic Church was famous for doing, they did not attempt to erase that belief system. Rather, they built upon it. You know, and this has happened over a couple of periods. It happened also in Europe. I was just having a conversation with Mr. Richards about how when Catholicism came to the pagan areas of Europe, they adopted many European pagan traditions, right? There's no Christmas tree Right? In ancient Israel, for instance, right? this was part of the pagan uh, winter solstice celebration, which Catholics uh, attach themselves to. Right? So even European Catholicism, you could argue, is syncretic. Right? There's no flowers and eggs and bunnies and whatnot. Right? All of these things are pagan symbols. And you guys can probably guess, bunnies and flowers are springtime symbols of 
fertility. Right? So the Catholics attached their celebration Easter to a traditional springtime celebration in Europe, likewise their celebration Christmas to a traditional European celebration of the solstice. So this idea of Catholicism melding, becoming syncretic with local tradition is not new when the Catholics arrive in Latin America. But because Latin America is more recent, it, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a really good illustration. And by the way, you guys, it really worked. As recent as 1950, 98% of Mexico was Catholic, right? So the effort that the Dominicans, Franciscans, and Jesuits engaged in was on the surface extremely success successful. But what we want to suggest is that it goes a little further beneath the surface. So let's get to the actual story of this lady right here, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and equally as important, this young man right here, approximately your age, about 16 or so, he was an Aztec, a Nahuatl speaker named Juan Diego. If you don't know, Nahuatl is the language of the Aztecs. It is still spoken in central Mexico to this day, and uh, it, it does play uh, into this story. So, uh, so the story goes, Juan Diego, a recently conquered young Aztec youth, was walking outside of Mexico City. And he was, he was, uh, it was December of uh, 1524, so just three years after the conquest. And he found himself on a hill. Now this was not just any hill, and I'll get to that in just one moment. But it was there on this hill that before Juan Diego appeared this lady, and she spoke to him in his language, Nawada, and she was dark-skinned, like he was. And she said to him in Nawada, I am your mother. I am the mother of all of you Aztec people. And you must venerate me, worship me, and join me. P.S. My name's the Virgin Mary. Right? So this person right, uh, took on the Catholic uh, terminology, right? We, the, the Catholics had a sort of mother goddess, if you will, the Virgin Mary. Now back to that hill. That hill that Juan Diego found himself on the day that the Virgin Mary appeared was the same hill that had been used by the Aztec people to venerate their own mother goddess. And that woman's name was Tonosin, right? So in the pantheon of gods, the Aztecs already had a mother goddess. Tonosin. She had a shrine on the top of a hill just north of what had been Tenochtitlan and was now Mexico City. And it was right there that the Catholic mother goddess appeared before that Aztec god. Pretty convenient. Worked out pretty well that that's the place that she chose to appear. Right? So what we see happening, I, I can't really speak to theology, nor can I, can I determine if that is actually a true story. But the point nonetheless remains that the exact same place that the Aztec mother goddess Tonosin appeared is where the Virgin Mary appeared. And further, as you guys read about for today, when the Aztecs were originally venerating the Virgin of Guadalupe, they referred to her as Tonosin. Right? So what we actually see here right, is not entirely the Virgin Mary, but rather a mix of the Aztec mother goddess Tonosin and the traditional Virgin Mary, right? I didn't mention it, but I should also mention, total crazy coincidence. The day that Juan Diego found the Virgin of Guadalupe on the top of this hill was also the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Perhaps you've heard of it, right? It's the feast day dedicated to the Virgin Mary, right? So a number of things clearly lined up Right, in order for the Catholic Church to, to connect their mother deity to the Aztec mother deity. But this was incredibly successful, right? As I said already, 98% adopt Catholicism. And it was really the Virgin of Guadalupe that was the agent for spreading Catholicism in uh, what had been the Aztec territories. It had not been terribly successful the first couple of years. But after the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, Aztec people really had someone that they could identify with. Right, and we see a tremendous spreading of uh, Catholicism from there. And, and so much so that the Virgin of Guadalupe actually ultimately, not only does it become the symbol of the Mexican people, but it becomes a symbol of revolution. 
And we'll see when the Mexicans actually gained their independence from the Spanish in the 1820s, the first original cry of independence is called the Grito de Guadalupe, the cry of Guadalupe. Right? As she became the symbol not only of religion, but also of nationalism. Right? So it's interesting. We'll see that eventually the version of Guadalupe helps to undermine Spanish rule, but initially it was a very effective step towards creating Spanish rule. You know, perhaps it was all a coincidence. Perhaps it was a coincidence that this deity appeared on this, on this feast day of the Virgin Mary on the hill of Tonosin. Or perhaps it was a very effective tool by the Catholic Church to identify with local religion and to help to spread their cause. Regardless, it was extremely successful. And regardless, we see a, a goddess that is both Catholic and not Catholic. If you go to a Catholic church in Europe, you will not see this proliferation of flowers. Right? Flowers are an absolutely essential part of Catholicism in Latin America. And this is, again, because the flower is a, is a symbol of fertility, and it was a powerful indigenous traditional symbol. So whenever we see uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, she's always associated with flowers. Um, and this is not only because flowers were an important part of her story, but because the flower is a, is a powerful uh, traditional image. Right? If you don't know the whole story, uh, so it goes, no one believed Juan Diego when he first saw the Virgin. So she commanded him to gather flowers, amazingly growing in December. And he gathered them in his cloak, he threw the cloak open, and miraculously the cloak had inside a picture of the Virgin which to this day um, is still being venerated outside Mexico City. It's kind of like a sort of church meets theme park. Uh, I really encourage you guys, if you're ever in Mexico City, such a cool town, you should go check it out. Like, this is the, the uh, shrine to the Virgin. Here's one angle. Here's another angle. It's a massive, uh, a massive uh, uh, part of the, the culture. Okay. Now that's story number one about syncretic religion. Here's story number two about syncretic religion, right? In the case of the Aztecs, the Catholics said, you guys have a mother goddess? We have a mother goddess too. We call her the Virgin Mary. And as the Catholics spread southward, they encountered a different group of indigenous people. These peoples were called the Zapotecs. Zapotecs occupy what is today Oaxaca, Chiapas, southern Mexico. And the Zapotecs had a very pr profound indigenous tradition also. It was ancestor worship. And ancestor worship is popular in numerous uh, cultures around the world. But the Aztecs had a very powerful tradition of ancestor worship. So the Catholics said, you guys have a tradition of ancestor worship? We have a tradition of ancestor worship too. It's called All Saints Day. We worship the dead saints of our past Catholic tradition. And that is why All Saints Day, November 1st, in southern Mexico, but really in all of Mexico, but particularly in southern Mexico, is known as the Day of the Dead. Right? So the Day of the Dead is another example of a syncretic religion, wherein the Zapotec tradition of venerating their ancestors meets the Catholic tradition of venerating saints. And that is why Day of the Dead is November 1st. Right? But really, again, this we can see an as or rather a Zapotec tradition. And I've got a few uh, kind of cool Day of the Dead uh, uh, pictures for you guys as well, or as we say in Spanish, Dia de los Muertos. Um, let's see if we got a few more. Right. Uh, you know, the, the dead are, are supposed to rise uh, uh, from the grave that day. And I particularly like this one because, again, it shows the mixed nature of Mexican culture. Just like most Mexican people are at least a little bit indigenous and a little bit European, we can see here, right, the sort of classic, stereotypical Mexican, but just beneath, right, is his Zapotec heritage, right? So when we think of syncretic religions, we think of religions that mix, right, religions that might one might try to replace another, but that pretty much never happens. And there's examples of this throughout the world. Hinduism is the same way in India, but, but to keep it focused on Catholicism, we can see several examples when the Catholics attempted to replace an indigenous tradition, but they couldn't do it. Instead, they ended up with a mix, and that mix is called syncretic. You can see here one more image for you guys. Right? This, is, this is a Day of the Dead altar, and you can really see how much is going on here culturally. You've got traditional Catholic images like the Virgin, right? but also a tremendous amount of offerings. Flowers, corn, this is all corn down here, uh, some Coronas. 
being offered, for all sorts of things being offered, right? And again, in, 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 in an altar situation that really doesn't <laughs> exist in the Catholic tradition. So as a consequence, there's a number of uh, aspects of, uh, of the Catholic Church in Mexico that simply don't exist in uh, Europe, and that's because of this mixing, or again, this syncretic concept. It doesn't just happen in Latin America, but I personally have like a super deep love for Latin America. It's the part that I'm most exposed to, so I thought that I would uh, present this to you guys in the context of Latin America. But again, syncretic religion happens across the planet. We saw it happen in Europe when the pagans met the Catholics, and then we see it again in Latin America when the Catholics meet indigenous people. Can I take any questions? Was that good? Yes. Um, are you saying that this is like a conscious effort on behalf of the, not, on the part of the Catholic Church, to like superimpose their own religion, or was it just something that the native populations did naturally to sort of help us? Great question. No, I am absolutely saying it was a conscious effort by the Catholic Church. Right? They were absolutely in competition with the Protestants. Right? Converting indigenous people was a very, very strong goal for the, the Catholic conquerors. So no, this was absolutely a marketing campaign, if you will. Right? I mean, I'm not going to get into the religious aspects of it. Right? I mean, maybe this lady did show up on the hill. I don't know. But I will say that it was an incredibly convenient coincidence right? in terms of the Catholic Church. Right? And again, it, it, you can't completely force someone to give up their religion, so you don't force them to give it up. You just encourage them to change it a little bit. Keep worshiping the mother goddess, but how about you call her Mary instead of Tonosi? Right? And that's the level that the Catholics were on. They were doing anything they could to win converts. And I can't stress enough, you guys, this is very, very, very purposeful. Right? They did it on purpose in an effort to win converts because they thought they were in this really kind of struggle with Protestantism. So no, it absolutely was intentional. Great question. Other questions? Mr. Henderson. Were all three of the Catholic orders equally involved in syncretizing their religion, or is one more? That's a good question. So the Franciscans get credit for initially uh, rolling out the idea of the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, but the Jesuits were sort of, you guys read about the Jesuits, they were really kind of the, the Catholic shock troops um, in, uh, in Mexico and beyond. So I can't really say in terms of the larger span of history if, if one deserves the most credit, but it was the Franciscans who were the first missionaries in Mexico and who originally uh, uh, rolled out uh, this concept. Anything else? Yes? Um, I know that the Protestants in, or the English Protestants in, America, in Northern America didn't care for converting but did any other Protestants want to convert just as much as the Catholics did? Interestingly, part of the reason why Mexico is not as Catholic as it used to be is because of Protestant missionaries. So at the time, in the 1500s, the Catholics were far, far, far more motivated to, to engage in conversions. But in the last 50 years, it's the Protestants that have been more motivated. And they're actually now, today, it's, I, I just looked it up, it's only about 84% of Mexican folks are Catholic, right? So that other 16% has uh, gone Protestant, typically evangelical. So uh, the short answer is in the 1500s, no, the Catholics were the primary missionary uh, uh, um, influencers of the New World, but eventually Protestants start to catch up. Yes? Um, I'm confused to whether or not um, you're saying that did the Catholics actually modify their doctrine to sort of fit with the Aztecs, or did they only pull from parts of their doctrine that were similar? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by modify. You know, the whole idea of syncretism is you can't get people to completely forget what it is they knew before. Right? You can't, it's very, very difficult to do. It's very difficult to get people to entirely reject that which they knew before. Right? So rather than forcing people to reject that which they knew before, they were just asking for a little modification. So, I mean, is it true that the Virgin Mary is a significant part of uh, Catholic doctrine? Absolutely. But, you know, the, the exact circumstances of, of her uh, sort of filling the role of tonal scene, you know, requires some, some variations. 
And what I'm saying to you is that when it comes to tradition, if you go to a Catholic Mass in Mexico, it is not the same than a Catholic Mass in Europe. If you go to a Catholic wedding in Mexico, it's not the same, right? Just in, in terms of uh, very minor details. I've been to both. I actually go to church more in Mexico than I do in America, just because I find it really interesting culturally. And um, the short story is that there are subtle changes, right, to the tradition. Uh, um, I mean, obviously the Bible is the same, but the actual way that people interact with the religion shifts, right? And that's where we see syncretism, right? Is, is that it's not quite the same. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Mr. Richards. And, and Dave, if I could add to that, the cult of the Virgin Mary in 15th, 16th century Europe would have been very, very strong at this time. And these sort of veneration of one particular person or another sort of ebbs and flows within the Catholic Church from century to century. But at this point, that cult would have had great strength. Um, and so it, I think a very easy thing to sort of transplant and find a similarity in the new world. And one of the things you guys may remember is one of the things the Catholics did at the Council of Trent was they re-stated uh, uh, their dedication to the veneration of saints. Right? So the fact that we see the veneration of saints happening through the Day of the Dead or through the Virgin of Guadalupe, we could also see as a consequence of the Catholics really uh, uh, sort of reinvigorating their own commitment to their doctrine as a result of the Protestant Reformation. But I, I started with the Protestant Reformation for a reason, right? because that gives Catholics really strong motivation to go out and try to spread their religion. And they'll do whatever they can, including modifying a little bit to accept local traditions, right? And that's the really key idea. And, and I'll, I'll say it one more time, this is not only in Latin America, religion the world over is famous for this, right? Religion will modify itself in order to win converts. This is just a really uh, more recent example. Mr. Richards. Where, where, where does, David, where do you think this, the, the debate that's raging between De Las Casas and Sepulveda and, and this conceptualist, or this syncretic religion, where do you, how do you see those fitting in? Well, I mean, this is the key, right? I mean, in many ways, the Virgin of Guadalupe pacifies in a way that the conquistadors cannot. Right? Because the Virgin of Guadalupe actually sort of wins over, if you will, the hearts and minds, right? where we actually now have a, a Catholic, European Catholic symbol being promoted and venerated by indigenous people. So Mr. Richards is referencing sort of the, the idea of, of the violence of the conquest versus sort of sticking up for indigenous people. And the really cool thing about the Virgin is that it, it sort of eliminates even the, ne the necessity for violence in part because some stages of the conquest are over, but also in part because people are really won over. Right? This is a very effective in terms of actually spreading the, uh, the message of Catholicism, but also the larger European message. Okay, you guys, uh, if you play basketball, you're supposed to sign in down here uh, to say that you've been here, and that was a half an hour pretty much on the dot, so thank you guys all for coming. <laughs>